National Assembly resumes after a long holiday, holds first plenary session for the year. You're welcome to The Gavel. I'm Linda Kibi. Legislative activities resumed in earnest during the week, with both chambers holding debates on some issues and working on various legislations. Insecurity in the country was a major topic of debate in the Senate during the week. Lawmakers were pushing strongly for community and state policing, efficient border patrols, as well as better welfare packages for security personnel and synergy among security agencies. The list of violent crimes in Nigeria in the last few weeks of 2021 is a cause for concern. There have been reported cases of kidnappings, banditry, killings, farmers and herders clashes, communal clashes, and so on. Barely two months into 2021, these violent crimes have left a trail of deaths and destruction across the country. On Wednesday, February 10th, lawmakers dedicated a large chunk of plenary discussing the relentless insecurity in the country and seeking solutions to the crisis. Between May, between 27, 2017 and May 2020, there have been 654 attacks, 2,539 killed, 393 wounded, 253 kidnapped, 16 raped, 7,582 homes destroyed. That is an analysis that has been done by a research firm that is based in Brussels on what has happened in this country. And I listen to us here, for us to be saying that they're not Nigerians. It's an indictment on our leadership that people are coming into this country, they're maiming our people, they're killing our people, they're raping our people, and we are saying they're not Nigerians. And yet these are the same security people that we are now going to promote to be ambassadors of this country, representing this country. It's an indictment, and it's not, it's not acceptable. I represent a border community that's bordering some neighboring towns, uh, neighboring countries, I went there over the weekend. The whole place has been destroyed by all these herdsmen. People's earnings, people's lives has been destroyed. People are that, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are taking all these cattle away, they are doing it. It's a business. And these people, their, their own lives are being destroyed because somebody else's business, they, they say they are trying to feed their cows. It is upsetting. And we must rise up to this occasion. This country is on the precipice of, of, of a civil war or, or, or of even falling apart, or, of a failed state. Mr. President, we're all in denial, especially government. And if we were not in denial, we would have declared insecurity a national emergency. The way we declared COVID a national emergency. Because if we had done that, we would have had multi-sectoral approach to tackling this insecurity. Right now, we are an endangered species. People are going into homes to abduct, to rape, to do all sorts. Hats men are everywhere. The figures that are coming out of insecurity are higher than the figures that are coming out of COVID. We need what is called border patrol police. We don't have it in this country. And in a country that you don't have border patrol, your border will be very, very porous. These people are coming in. Since we agree that they are foreigners, they are coming in. If we have a border patrol police, we will be able to control some of them. Then they come in, again, like somebody said, how do they get themselves armed with AK-47? If you see some of the sophisticated weapons these people were carrying, in those areas, you will be shocked. Mr. President, it's high time, again, we have what is called database so that we'll be able to know our people in this country. So we're saying they are not Nigerian. Some of them will show you Nigerian passport. When they are showing you Nigerian passport, you cannot claim they are not Nigerian. We have set up a committee that have worked on restructuring. And I believe the committee have submitted their report. This is one angle in which we should start looking at. And because... Inside this uh, restructuring, there is a security issue that has been discussed extensively with borders on the state police. And I believe at this point in time, the creation and the establishment of state police, we should start looking in this direction. If truly we want to put an end to this security situation that has been affecting us as a country. The sanity of Nigeria life is no more with them again. Nigeria cannot sleep with their two eyes closed. 
Now, uh, last time in Edo State, Mr. President, one Mr. Denis Abuda, who came from the America to, uh, to have a holiday in Nigeria with his uh, family in Fuga, was killed when he was going back to America. The implication of this is that most Nigerians from America will not even come home. The family or the children of this Abuda will not come home because of the banditry. Mr. President, the federal government should come to the ears of Nigeria quickly and fastly. They, this, this, the, the, the police, the, the same police, should take off. From Mr. President. There were also reactions to herders farmers' conflict, with differing views on how the crisis should be managed. I find it difficult to believe in the 21st century that a governor of a state who has taken oath to protect preserve and protect the Constitution of Nigeria, which embodies fundamental human rights, fundamental rights of residents, will come openly to ask people who are not indigenous of his state to leave his state on the pretext of something that they are doing. And their cost of law. We have cost of law to make determination on that. While we see in the social media houses of people being burnt who are not from the states where the burning is taking place, the only exception I hold, and I want to so, so do with commendation, is the government, the governor of Edo State. He came out to say he will protect anybody, any Nigerian who is making a living in his state. And anybody who commits offense, the courts of law take care of him. No Nigerian is being sent away from anywhere. Criminals are being sent away from the forest where they are. And so, when we now come here and say, uh, some people, after doing this thing and they're sending people away, you send the wrong message out. The message is simple. The police, IG, has told us these are criminal elements coming from outside Nigeria. And what we should ask ourselves is, if somebody is a criminal and he is in the forest, what is he doing inside there? And we want to paper over matters of this nature to please whatever. What we want to say is simple. We either want to solve this problem, and in order to solve the problem, the desideratum is that all criminal elements that are coming into this country from wherever they are must be flushed out. Section 43 of our Constitution, which grants the right to every Nigerian to live and acquire property in any part of the country is a section that confers a right as to where you can live and own property. This is different from ownership of land or property. Ownership of land is thoroughly and decisively addressed in the Land Use Act of Nigeria. And it provides for only three means of ownership of land in this country, either by government, federal, state, or local, or individual ownership, or corporate ownership. In other words, even though I have a right to live and acquire property in any part of Nigeria, I do not have a right to trespass on the land owned by any other person in this country. I'm particularly happy about Prayer 4 here, talking on the need to end hard men and farmers' conflict. This borders on these relevant constitutional provisions. Mr. President, it is not the right of anyone, and as a government, we must continue to emphasize this. It's not the right of anyone to trespass on the land that belongs to any other person. The hardest that <clears throat> trespass this country. Not all of them are Nigerians. That is absolutely true. My constituency is not on the border, but near the border, just neighboring Yobe State. And every year, herders either driving camels or cows or goats and sheep come across immediately after harvest and they sack the farmers, they take away their harvest 
And if they resist, they kill them. This has been going on for more than 20 years. And I have been raising that issue in my local community, in the Emirate Council. And we have written to the immigration to stop them from coming in and the customs, but nothing had happened. Now they are spread all over Nigeria. Political leaders must be careful. We must be careful of what we say in a very incendiary environment because the people listen to us as their leaders. So if we appear to be divisive, they will find justification in taking actions that all of us will regret. Nobody is saying the situation is okay. The situation is not okay. If you have criminals occupying areas that they shouldn't be, of course the security agencies must take the necessary steps to ensure that they address the situation. But these are criminals, and that is a specialized criminal activity. All other criminals must be flushed out. Otherwise, how do we have peace? Just like Senator Adam Balkachua uh, uh, said, we have to address criminality. We have to defeat criminality. But we also have to nip in the bud that desire, that excitement sometimes of people speaking as champions of their tribes and ethnic groups. We are simply leaders, and the people of this country expect us to keep them united. At the end of a debate, lawmakers asked President Buhari to direct the newly appointed service chiefs to reorganize the country's security architecture, which would efficiently respond to the security crisis in the country. They are also urging state governors to implement the National Livestock Transformation Plan to address the farmer header conflicts. So we'll have the... Meanwhile, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Femi Bajabia Mila, has warned that every time a citizen going about their business is killed or kidnapped, loses their property or livelihood, government has failed in its obligation. According to Honorable Bajabia Mila, the Constitution obligates all who swear to serve in government to do everything to protect the lives and property of all citizens and promote their well-being above all else. Honorable colleagues, the true test of government is in our ability to protect the most vulnerable amongst us. We cannot separate the goal of economic prosperity from the ambition to ensure that all our people live in a just society, free from abuse of power and protected by a justice system built on fairness and the rule of law. Therefore, we will shortly begin considering bills to amend the Administration of Criminal Justice Act and we'll follow up with a long overdue review of the Trafficking in Persons, Prohibition Enforcement and Administration Act and other legislation that seek to deliver a justice system that works for all. Every time a citizen going about their business is killed or kidnapped, loses their property or livelihood, we have failed in our obligation. From the abundance of these failures has emerged a culture of self-help in matters of internal security that portends grave danger for our nation's continued existence. If ever there was a time for us to put aside all other considerations, especially the petty concerns of partisanship and politics, it is now. If ever there was a time to set aside our differences of tribe and religion to focus on a concerted effort to defeat the challenges of insurgency and banditry, communal violence, and the violent struggle over land, that time is now. The forces that threaten our lives and property our sovereignty and nationhood do not make any exceptions based on the God we pray to or the language of our native tongue. From every region and state, citizens of every tribe and religion have suffered and will continue to suffer the pain of death and the grief, and the grief of loss until we put an end once and for all to the terrors of banditry, insurgency, and malignant crime in all forms. Let's take a look at some of the major activities in the House of Representatives during the week. The House of Representatives Committee on Public Accounts is expressing displeasure over the refusal of the Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, Ms. Amelia Kiari, to appear before the committee. The committee is unhappy that for the tenth time, the NNPC has written to it seeking deferment of appearance. 
Lawmakers are furious and have resolved to grant the GMD one more opportunity and would pass its resolution in favor of the Auditor General. The chairman of the committee, Uluwaluke, also alleges that the GMD has directed subsidiaries of the NNPC not to honor the invitation of the committee. The worst part of this story is that the writing subsidiaries on NNPCs, NNPC who also have queries to answer. And the group managing director ordered them not to appear because they are subsidiaries. I want to say that the GMD is not in a position to dictate to the parliament on how the parliament should conduct its, its business. Clark, do a strongly worded letter to the GMD and all the subsidiaries that you have invited, that we have invited, that if they fail to show up the next adjourned date, you know, rather than um, embarking on um, uh, rough -ruff you know, summoning, arrest, and all that, we'll simply resolve all the issues raised in favor of the Auditor General of the Federation and then tender it on the floor for adoption. The House of Representatives has passed a resolution to investigate and recover monies, assets, and dividends of the federal government from public enterprises. Representative Mukhtar Ahmed, who raised a matter of urgent public importance, notes that prior to and post privatization of some federal public enterprises, the federal government still shares in some of the enterprises and are therefore entitled to dividends. Aware that some of the assets, cash and residual shares in privatized public enterprises are still unaccounted for, while some of the privatized companies like NICO Insurance, Nigerian Insurance and Nike Luxury Hotels are already taken over by Amcon over acquisition, I mean acquisition loans. Concerned that the federal government may not be able to recover those monies, dividends and assets, except if they are properly determined. Further aware that the federal government needs money to finance the budget, the House resolved to constitute an ad hoc committee, Mr. Chairman, I mean Mr. Speaker, of the House to investigate, determine those assets and report back to the House within eight weeks. Host communities of Nigeria producing oil and gas is again insisting on 10% equity shareholding in oil companies as well as 10% of operational gains in the petroleum industry bill. This is against the 2.5% share for host communities proposed by the federal government in the PIB presently before the National Assembly. Speaking in an interview States, with journalists in Abuja, States, the president of HOSCOM says the vandalism of pipelines and youth restiveness, which have been harming production in the region, would continue if government fails to approve the 10%. That the position of OSCOM and the gas project states and host communities in Nigeria, that our demand for 10% equity shareholding is sacrosanct and not in contest as agreed by all parties and contained in our submission, which includes the amending of the bill in the various sections that has to do with the issue of vesting of petroleum and ownership, the issue of settlers to be amended to operating companies, creation of trust funds and management infrastructure to the call host communities, host call. Ahead of reports of the resumption of NSAR's protest in Lagos, a federal lawmaker, Senator Geshem Basi, is warning the protesters not to go ahead with the protest. He says he's worried about the safety of the protesters and residents if the protests happen. Can they guarantee that they're, that they're because they are a non-violent group and, I, and we had all supported them, the NSAR movement, when it first came out, all of us here supported them and we supported their right to peaceful protest. That one is given, it's a constitutional um, um, guarantee. But what we are saying is that what we saw in October was that the NSAS um, protests were hijacked by criminals. You saw it in Lagos, you saw it in Benin, you saw it in Calabar, I saw it in my house. They were hijacked by criminals and they cleaned me out. They came to my house, they cleaned, they took everything, even toothbrush, they didn't leave. So, so my question is, having experienced 
the hijack of answers personally. My question to them is, can they guarantee, they, the answers organizers, that their protest will not be hijacked? The National Assembly is working on amending the Electoral Act and has set a target of passing the bill in the first quarter of this year. I spoke with two members of civil society organizations who work on electoral reform to find out the critical areas they want to see addressed in the amended Electoral Act. There are some fundamental changes that will have to come and which has already been proposed and it will be very happy if we see it. The establishment of the INEC fund is something that it will do very good for the work of the commission if enacted, if that provision actually sails through. So ensuring that they have their own pocket of fund and to do things and to spend, that is important. But what is the most important is also the, re uh, the release of the election expenses. So now, this amendment is actually proposing that the, um, the expenses for every election should be released like two years prior to an election. So by this 2021 now, INET should already start having its budget and the final tranche should come six months before the elections. Like this is very, very perfect because without resources, without financial resources, planning becomes very difficult. Yes, we know that the last two commissions have always had enough money from the, from the government when it is time and they are on the consolidated revenue fund. But the fact still remains that the timeliness affects planning. And if we want to see election as a circle, one that is not really just about the day of elections where people will have to vote, but they have to plan through this process, ensuring that this provision is passed will have a lot of positive effect on the conduct of the 2023 elections and subsequent elections. Then INEC will have no excuse to give for planning challenges. I, I think with the Electoral Act, uh, Electoral Act is an implementing law uh, on elections. Of course, the gun norm is the constitution. Uh, and so I think sometimes people get confused. What should be in the Electoral Act? What should be in the Constitution? Uh, there are conversations, for instance, around uh, inclusivity, participation, particularly representation of women. Uh, and sometimes you've had women's groups, civil society organizations advocate uh, for special seats allocated to women. Now, when you look at the Constitution, it doesn't provide for that. So you cannot... Uh, as you know, the Constitution is superior to the Electoral Act, so you cannot use an inferior law to achieve that. It means that you must go back to work on the Constitution, and I think that that's what the committee has been trying to explain uh, to Nigerians, uh, especially those who are advocating, and, and we here are advocating from plaque. Uh, they need to create special seats for women, where only women can contest, in addition to contesting uh, and challenging for the existing seats. But this has to be a constitution amendment, because that's the only way it can work. And the electoral law has created what, it, what is identified as electoral offenses. For all manners of electoral offenses, vote buying, vote selling, uh, campaign finance, uh, violence, toggery, all of these issues have been identified as offenses under the electoral act. Now, the major problem is implementation. The responsibility for implementing this is not domiciled anywhere. So while you may say that it is an offense to buy votes, it's an offense to own more than one voter's card, these offenses are described, penalties are provided, but there is nothing in the law to say INEC has a responsibility to prosecute. Now this is where we call it a day on this week's edition of The Gavel. If you have any views on any of the issues discussed, please email us on thegavel at channelstv.com. Thank you for staying with us and see you again next week.